Um, so a little bit about me, uh, I originally came from a psychology background. I finished my undergrad at Michigan State in psychology and then just moved to Seattle for my master program in CDE. Uh, and it's a two-year program. I'm only one year in. Uh, I'm currently working at Dell uh, full-time as a UX design intern. Uh, as it's going to be all the way till the end of summer. And, you know, even though today it's mostly about CDE, but it, feel free to um, message me in Slack or email me for any questions you might have. So I'm going to get started. Uh, just to introduce about CD for a little bit. So even though I'm in the master program, CD actually have undergrad degree, master, uh, and PhD as well. Uh, and we kind of take like a holistic view uh, when it comes to UX design. So we have a lot of research classes, design classes, and strategy. So strategy means that you also get to learn a little bit about like business. So like how do you validate your idea? How do you measure the success? You know, because a lot of times when you're getting there and work in a real field, you're not just designed for people and user, uh, but you're also designing for the business. How do you ensure you balance that? Uh, and our program do a really good job of teaching those kind of stuff as well. And uh, in terms of master program, we are very flexible because most of our classes are at nighttime from six to 10. Uh, so we actually have quite a bit of full-time people who work full-time and come to school, uh, let's say once every week for, for class. Uh, so there's like a huge flexibility there. A lot of people love that. And if you actually are an international student, you might have a little bit less of that. So you kind of have to keep your full-time status, but at the same time, you can do something just like what I'm doing right now. I'm not taking classes. I'm just taking um, full-time internship, which will count towards a full-time student status. But questions on that, you can just um, message me individually. Uh, some highlights of our program, we have a really great network, uh, not just because our alumni go out and work in all those big tech, but because we have really strong bond with those companies and they like to collaborate with us. So uh, constantly you will get to know people from uh, comp big tech companies and they come in to bring in talks and stuff. And that also bring us a lot of professional development resources. Uh, so we have a lot of, during every quarter, uh, quarters. We'll have a lot of workshops, panels, events, sponsor, or organized by our industry partners. Uh, and then also a lot of, you know, design gym and hackathons, um, not just organized by our department, but also by organization like DevStack, uh, uh, DevStack. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities there to practice. Uh, at the same time, as a second year master student, you actually get a chance to apply to this Microsoft mentorship program, who they give you like a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Uh, you get a good connection from there as well. And another very great asset about our program is that uh, we don't, we not only just have full-time professionals, um, uh, professors, but at the same time, we have industry professionals who teach class as well. So um, they all come from a very wide range of backgrounds, including our students. They all have really wide range of expertise uh, and they come from different industries like healthcare, we have architects, and they're all very well versed in what they do. And that's how you get to have more exposure into different fields. Uh, and that's really important, you know, when you go into your job, you, have, you uh, get to know more about how do you design and how do you bring different perspective on to approach problems, right? So our students are, are some of our students are like me who come from uh, recent undergrad and then join the program right away. And who are people who already work in, you know, UX field or non UX field for years and they try to pivot their career. So um, it's a really great uh, community and you get to learn a lot from each other. Um, and there are some classes that I've taken so far and some classes that I'm looking forward to that I want to talk about uh, a little bit. Uh, so, so for something like visual communication, it was really fun for me. I came from a non-design background, so it was really helpful. Uh, I touched base on uh, some design fundamentals, you know, including type hierarchy, color, layout, font. Uh, it was mostly individual work, but you get a critique uh, in groups and uh, you just learn from each other like that. Uh, some UX basic class like user service design, uh, you get to teach, I get to learn from, you know, how to do research, how do you build uh, a wireframe and low type prototypes all the way to high fi if you want to. Uh, and it was taught by industry professional and constantly they bring uh, industry guest speakers and then you get to connect with them in that way as well. 
Uh, and usually these kind of costs are mostly group projects. So it's really helpful for you to build a product, uh, product and portfolio from the ground up. And actually you gotta define your role in your group, right? You wanna be more focused on research, you wanna be focused on more product or PM, that kind of role. Uh, so it's really flexible in that way. Uh, some classes like interaction prototyping are also very fun. I haven't taken yet, but uh, people have been uh, telling me good things about it. It's also taught by industry professional and you kind of, you know, get to develop your expertise in design development uh, and uh, from zero to one. Also critique some products that are available in the market right now and you get to learn from that. And uh, in order to graduate, we need to have capstone, which means um, you need to form your own team most of the time and you pitch uh, to industry partners. So Google, Microsoft, Airbnb, those are some of the big companies that uh, every year they joined us. Uh, and you pitch as a team to show them how you are the best team to take in their challenge. Sometimes they take their idea uh, into the consideration and sometimes they will be really free for you to explore. Uh, and it's, it's a really fun thing to do, you know, it's not just work, uh, but at the same time they provide you guidance uh, on problem solving. And uh, sometimes if you need to do some user research or user interview or user testing, they might give you a little bit of money for that too, right? So. Uh, it's really helpful in that way. Uh, another really great asset is a directed research group. And a lot of people uh, enjoy that really much because it's research project that conducted by a PhD, our PhD student and also professor. So it's like a really great way to network with professor uh, to dive deep into research. And these are not just for people who are interested in research, right? They actually, uh, there are actually a lot of designers, developers in every project too, because they are trying to not just understanding the research insights, but also bring those insights into applicable uh, products, uh, tools, and things like that. Uh, so these are what I'm going to talk about, about CDE. If you have any question uh, about CDE, how to apply, uh, feel free to message me. Uh, and actually, I'm going to drop um, the link about our program in the chat right now. Uh, you can take a look at that. Um, other than that, I'm gonna jump into how do you design to empower people? Um, I wouldn't say I'm the expert at this, but I'm putting some insights and views here that I've learned so far from my personal experience or uh, from people that I know of. Uh, so basically, most of, first of all, I would say language um, is what's most important, right? So language are the gates of how you convey message, how you communicate. So it's really important that when you're designing to empower people, uh, you need to translate really complex information into understandable human language, right? We see this happen a lot in complex enterprise system, healthcare, laws and politics. There are a lot of terminologies there not everybody will understand, right? So. Um, you need to present and translate those language and terminologies into your user's point of view, right? So for example, if you ask a lawyer to explain a case for you, she and he is gonna use a different language than how a victim in that case will explain the case to you. And that's gonna be different than how the uh, criminal in that case gonna explain the case to you. So uh, it's just kind of an example uh, to let you know that when you design, you need to make sure who you're designing for and whether actually I can understand that language and what's the best way for you to communicate uh, the important message that you wanna communicate, right? So that means you need to distill dense information into really precise and simple message to get that through. Um, and also another really important thing is uh, provide guidance and give options. Uh, so, you know, like when you're designing, you actually let people know during a process, step by step, uh, what does each step mean? What are the consequences? What do they need to prepare for that step? And also give them options to proceed and back out. Uh, you know, so in this case, I know that some of your uh, prompt this weekend is about, you know, design for a process to help nurses to, you know, test the patients. And that would be really important for you to know what are people's priorities, right? And what do they actually care about? Uh, what a patient care about and what a nurse care about might be very different. And when you're designing for that, you might need to provide different login account. And different login leads you to different pages because based on what they care about the most, the message and guidance you provide is going to be different. Uh, and so it's all about how do you give users the confidence of knowing what to do next and also a sense of freedom and they feel like they're in control. And that's where the empowerment comes from. 
And also uh, from my personal experience, I felt like um, based on your design, how to build resilience and trust is very important as well. Uh, people's behavior, you know, changes based on the signal and feedback we receive from our environment, right? Just like how we interact with our friends and strangers, we sense their emotion, we sense their feedback, and we make decisions and we, we react based on that. So it's the same thing with technology and people, same thing with system and people. When you're designing, you need to make sure you design react to people's actions accurately and stable uh, and that's going to influence how they perceive your product that's how it's going to influence how they perceive your brand eventually right so for me i'm designing for dell uh, for an upgrade process right so for them it's a hardware uh, it's a software on top of a hardware and when they are doing upgrades they are really um, high risk there for them to lose their data because sometimes one note goes down and might not come back. What happened there? Did you uh, prevent some errors before you do the upgrade, right? So every time you bring in new upgrade and new release, you bring in new codes and that influences their workflow and that influences the, their client. And some of their job are high risk there, right? So some of their system of demand uh, can lose their job by you know, not doing this well and lose the company's data. And that's really uh, risky and scary for a lot, a lot of users that you're designing, I'm designing for. So there's something that I'm practicing as well. How do I design an operate process to let them know that what's happening at each step and how do we prevent errors, right? Error prevention message and guidance after an error happened. What do they do? How do they fix it? And if they can't fix it, how do they reach out to our uh, tech support team to help them survive and uh, solve these kind of issues. So um, when you're designing to empower, uh, make sure your your system is actually clear, clear enough to help them build resilience and trust more and they're willing to risk a little bit more later on in the future when you bring in more uh, innovative feature and that's how you create an overall really well innovative brand um, as well. So um, these are some things that I want to touch on really fair quickly uh, about, you know, how to design to empower. And I kind of want to leave some time for you guys to kind of ask questions. If you are not comfortable asking questions here, you can, you know, message me um, individually in Slack as well. Uh, I got my email here. Um, you can reach out too. Would anyone like to go ahead and ask any questions or share their work for feedback? Um, I guess I don't have a project, but I just have a question about HCDE. Um, yeah. And so like, what is the hardest part of the process of like designing for you? Uh, what is the hardest part about designing or about a CDE? Because you mentioned HCDE, I mean, yeah, like the whole research process. Oh, okay, okay. So when you say CDE, actually, it's our program's name. Our program is called Human Centered Design Engineering. But I believe you're asking what's the hardest process in uh, in the whole user-centered design process? Yeah, I meant that, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, got it. Um, for me personally, the hardest part is actually validate um, from research due to, to design. So when you are doing initial research, how do you validate what your users say is actually what they want? Um, so I have worked in, um, for a consumer or a customer facing products before that's more, uh, you know, chasing the trends uh, and doing things what our, my, our competitors are doing, right? Compared to what I'm working on right now, it's more enterprise focused and that's really different. How you validate what your users say they need and how do you uh, validate that to your PM and how do you communicate that back to engineer about what is possible right now, what are the tech constraints, right? So it's that process of translating the language and making sure the message you get from your user are translating well into your design and that trans translate well to your PM and engineer. 
Um, so I feel like that loop for me is usually what's the most challenging. But usually if you've done it well, um, of course, you're not going to get it right all the time or you're not going to get it right the first time. But every time you do that, the more you do that, you get to understand what's actually possible and what's actually valid from what you learn from your user and what's actually possible now due to your current tech constraint and what you can actually do. Uh, and then it's also um, a part of, you know, how you imagine um, what your user need and how you can provide uh, at the same time walking the engineering slowly back to reality of what it can possibly provide right now to the best they can. Thank you. Um, hi, I had a quick question. Um, so which of the prerequisites would you say is like the most emphasized or kind of the most important that one does well or do you know like which classes they look at specifically that are important to them? You mean like before you apply to a CD program? Yeah, so the pr prerequisites for the application. So here's the thing. Um, if you're talking about prerequisite about classes, uh, I wouldn't say there's classes that are like, looking for that make sure you have taken in the past. Um, is that what you're talking about, about in terms of classes or you're talking more about like experience? So before you apply to the HCDE major, I think there's like five classes you need to take or something like that. I was kind of wondering like, do they look at the specific GPA you get in some of those classes and are some more important than others. So is computer science, for example, more important than an English composition class that's also necessary? You know what I mean? Like you, you also have to take statistics, I'm pretty sure. Uh, um, okay. uh, Megan, uh, you are currently a UW undergrad, am I correct? Yes. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, that part, uh, unfortunately, I do not know. Uh, I can ask somebody for you and get back to you later on if you give me your contact uh, because I did not graduate from UW undergrad. Uh, I applied for Michigan State. So for me, I don't know what are the prerequisites for you guys uh, that they say, they tell you guys that you have to take. Um, but okay, I can send you my email. Yeah, yeah, that works. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank so, you. So. <laughs> I think there's a question from Ashman uh, Singhle. He's asked, what are some examples of the careers people are getting into after HCDE? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so mostly they go into uh, the career fair um, as UX designer. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of titles out there. So UX designer and UX researcher are the most common ones. But we also have content strategists. Uh, or like call UX specialists, or, which is more so like a generalist uh, based on the company you apply, they might call it differently. So for Facebook, uh, they also recruit people from our program, but in their company, they don't call it UX designer, they call it product designer. So that could be also another title. Um, we, are, we also have people who go into product management, right? So not just, not just focus on design or research specifically, but a holistic view of how do you manage a product? How do you bring business uh, perspective into a product? So uh, we also have people to go that, go that way. Uh, it kind of depends, but I would say majority is US designer, product designer, uh, US researcher. So Rahan here asks, as a student from mechanical engineering, what kind of experience will be helpful to be selected for a CDE? Um, I want to apologize first. I did not come from mechanical engineering. Um, what I want to say, though, uh, in terms of being helpful to be selected for a CDE is that we have such a wide range of people coming from different backgrounds. They are not looking for one thing or two. Uh, they are not looking specifically what you have as uh, your undergrad degree. They're, they're looking at what you want to bring and what makes you want to go into UX, right? So everybody from different expertise have different things to bring on. Uh, we have people who study architecture, where we have nurses, uh, we have people uh, who study social science, psychology, who does not have engineering background or IT background or coding or design, uh, nothing like that. But we all had a purpose coming into this program that's something we want to get out of, right? So you might want to um, 
focus more in terms of what you want out of this program and then try to pursue aid them in that way uh, because everybody has something to bring onto the table, right? So for you as a mechanical engineer, what you have learned as a mechanical engineer that you feel like will help you success in this field and what you are lacking right now, you think you're lacking right now that our program can help you to achieve. Uh, so it's that kind of uh, both way contribution uh, that you want to talk a bit more in your application uh, I think that will be more helpful in terms of being selected. Uh, don't focus too much on what you have um, experienced so far. Um, we, yeah, so like people who get selected are where well versed in what they do and also have a wide range of experience, right? Some of them have never been in industry before. So um, in that sense, I would say um, bring more your spotlight, uh, what you contribute to the program, what you contribute to the field, what you want to achieve, and also how FCD can help you. Maybe more helpful to talk about there. Hi, I was wondering if I could get um, feedback on my project. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, right. Take a look. Um, at the same time, I think we only have three minutes left, so I want to make sure I actually answer people's questions. So uh, for Katrina, uh, do you mind I message you individually about the feedback? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, Everyone's on Slack, by the way, so you can connect with her. Huh? I said you you're on Slack, so you can communicate there. Yes, yes. So uh, I can communicate back with you about that. Uh, I just want to make sure. Is there anyone else have any questions about CD um, or you know design in general? I guess. Um, Okay, I don't, I'm not seeing any more questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, Krishina, you can go ahead and connect with um, Ethel on um, Slack. I'd just like to go ahead and thank Ethel so much for coming in today. I really appreciate it. Um, I think she went over her career in real detail as well as her experience in HCD, which I really enjoyed learning about because I myself am considering different master's programs. And okay. if you're even considering um, joining the undergraduate program of HCD, um, Definitely um, do check out their website. Uh, maybe go on ahead and share it in the chat as well as we'll share it in the announcements so you can go ahead and learn more about the program. And um, if you have any more questions, um, can they reach out to you uh, via Slack or how should they reach out to you at the uh, So I can actually type down my uh, email here really quick. Uh, you can email me. I'm also in your Slack channel. Uh, so you guys can just email me in the Perlo Fun section or just find me by Ethel Shu, uh, and then we can just go from there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, we're now gonna get started with the informatics uh, design critique session in the next um, five minutes. So if you wish to remain for that, um, please remain on the call. And if you have any questions in the interim, um, go ahead and type that in the chat. <laughs> 